This is our second lecture on the lead up into World War II uh, here for world history. We did a lot uh, of talks last uh, time about the events uh, taking place in Europe, uh, but we're going to switch gears quickly and talk about what's going on in the other side of the globe uh, with uh, militarists taking over Japan. Uh, several beliefs in Japan that begin to uh, kind of come into fruition as they begin to expand uh, their imperialistic uh, aspirations, like we saw the countries of Western Europe and the United States do in the closing of the 1800s and the early 1900s. The major belief that Japan feels is that they need more space to allow for their growing country. Uh, they're having a uh, large population increase and also to be able to become an industrialized western style nation uh, they need a lot more raw materials than the islands of japan themselves contain japan also uh, is kind of taking on this mantle of being a western style imperialist station wants to go and become more imperialist but they have different uh beliefs for them and they have kind of different motivations what they want to create is an asia for the asians the japanese will go into in french indochina and british hong kong and uh the China, which has been carved out in different spheres of influence, and kick out all the Europeans. The Asians will turn to Japan for leadership, and they'll be able to create a rival bloc against the uh, Western Europeans and the Americans. And so those two major beliefs uh, kind of lead into what Japan begins to do in September of 1931. That's where on a southern Manchurian railroad uh, near Mokden, uh, that's a sphere of influence in the north of China that's been kind of given over to the Japanese. An incident was manufactured. You can't see the air quotes that I'm making, but hopefully you can hear it in my voice. Uh, basically, the, this is a Japanese-invested railroad being built by the Japanese. And what they do is they plant a bomb, uh, uh, which is more less of a bomb and more of a firecracker, along the railroad as and they say act as evidence of this becoming Chinese aggression against the Japanese and thus requiring a response. What kind of response is this? Is that within hours, a full-scale Japanese invasion of Manchuria takes place. So what kind of lens the, uh, this that this was not a actual Chinese thing to do was that the Japanese, within hours of this railroad uh, thing happening, there was a Japanese of uh, army, naval, air force invasion uh, within this, uh, which kind of leads to that, that they've been planning this for a while. But the J Japanese army is going to able to gobble up Manchuria within a few months, and there it creates a, its own independent state of Manchuko, uh, which kind of uh, leads it to other territorial land holdings that's been carving out different islands in the Pacific at this point, and also uh, with places like Korea that they've added in their imperialist holdings. In 1933, uh, the League of Nations condemned this attack and issued a vote of censure against the Japanese. And the Jap Japanese say, well, this is exactly the same thing that the Europeans are doing. So if you're going to let the Europeans do this and not do anything and then yell at the Japanese for this, we're just going to go home. And they quit the League and they no longer have to abide by any decisions. This leads to a rebellion uh, kind of taking place in Japan amongst uh, more younger people who want more militaristic aspirations. Uh, and, and that allows for more militaristic generals to take control of Japan and lead it kind of down this military expansionist uh, path that it goes and takes. And so that's the situation that the Japan uh, begins to see following um, the 1920s as that it begins to become more and more led by generals and more and more taken over by the military and what the military wants and needs and desires for the Japanese. That includes taking over Manchuria because of, again, you can see all the damage, it's nice and circled there for you, on this picture of the Chinese sabotaging the, the, the Southern Manchuria Railroad in there. And so again, the, that incident right there, it, it kind of shows you the damage that was done, which then allows for this big, huge, giant invasion of the Japanese into Manchuria to take this over and carve this out for themselves. And you can try to see that the soldiers are marching through there and taking it over. The League of Nations doesn't like this, and they have a vote of censure for this. And we'll watch a short little video clip of Japan leaving the League of Nations and explaining why they're upset. The chairman announces the result of the ballot. 42 nations out of the 44 present condemn Japan's Manchurian policy. The rapport is adopted à l'unanimité. I call on 
Excuse me, Mr. Matsuoka, delegate of Japan. Japan, however, find it impossible to accept the report adopted by the Assembly. Addiction. The Japanese delegates refuse to accept the decision and sensationally walk out of the Assembly. A fateful step. So that's uh, increased aggression there, and that gives motivation for Germany to begin the act. Uh, following J Japan leaving the League of Nations, Germany in 1933 also quits the League of Nations, uh, where Hitler begins to say they can't, we, can't, we don't have to abide by any of the uh, restrictions that it says if we're no longer in there. In 1935, in defiance of the Treaty of Versailles, he begins a military buildup. And in 1936, he retakes the Rhineland. Uh, basically, uh, this again, as part of the Treaty of Versailles, is supposed to be demilitarized. Basically, marched troops into there, and everyone kind of with their own problems in the midst of the Great Depression allows that to happen. Italy begins its overseas uh, conquest with the invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. Again, we talked about in our imperialism chapter that Ethiopia was the only uh, African nation to successfully be able to beat out a uh, European uh, imperialist nation in Italy. Well, the Italians, as we said at the time, are going to forget about that. And so with tanks and poison, gun and poison gas and machine guns and airplanes, uh, Italy goes and invades the League of Nations up there. Uh, again, this is part of Mussolini's idea to create a new Roman Empire uh, and to live up to the ruins of the old Roman civilization that are scattered around the Italian peninsula. The League of Nations uh, penalizes Italy uh, with a uh, boycott of Italian goods, uh, and the leader of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, uh, goes to the League of Nations and very sensationally appeals in vain for the assistance. But again, uh, all the other countries are more worried about uh, themselves, and so it goes unnoticed. In Spain, a civil war is kicked off with a fascist leader, Francisco Franco, leading his group called the Nationalists, which again, fascists, uh, against Republican forces of the uh, leadership of Spain. Uh, the democracies of Western Europe and the United States are going to stay neutral in this civil war from 1936 to 1939, but the dictators, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Italy, uh, but uh, Hitler is going to send uh, money and backing and, and uh, even troops to be able to help uh, Franco uh, in this. Uh, the key takeaway for the Spanish Civil War is that you can see this as a warm-up for World War II. The Nazis uh, are going to be able to use this as kind of a practice run to be able to try to test out some of the new uh, theories and uh, methods uh, in, in real wartime conditions uh, to be able to kind of iron out the wrinkles in a kind of a, a less um, in, intense situation than what it is. Uh, with the help of the uh, Nazis and uh, Hitler, Franco is going to win the Spanish Civil War in 1939, and there's going to be a fascist-dominated uh, Spain uh, up through uh, the 1970s. Uh, so again, this is uh, Mussolini, uh, again, going in from Italian Somaliland and Italian-controlled Eritrea into um, Ethiopia or Abyssinia. And again, with tanks uh, and, uh, and machine guns and other stuff, they're able to pretty quickly uh, um, and, uh, back uh, kill the, the Ethiopians and not let them to do a whole lot. In Spain, uh, Francisco Franco is going to lead a, a coup uh, against the uh, Spanish king. And again, he's going to launch an attack from there. The German Condor Legion uh, of, the, of the Luftwaffe was sent into Spain uh, in order to be able to uh, provide stuff from there. Uh, and again, it's a pretty brutal fighting and killing from there. Uh, if you go to Barcelona uh, today, which uh, held out uh, against the fascists for a pretty long time, if you go off the Ramblas and you go kind of around there, you can see uh, this church that was bombed um, and there was at a schoolyard in the 1930s uh, Civil War. And when they rebuilt the church, they put the uh, bomb scarred and, and pockmarked uh, stonework back on there as a reminder uh, of the uh, the time uh, from there. Uh, so there, there's still uh, marks uh, from there. And then again, Americans in the Abraham Lincoln uh, Brigade uh, after went overseas and actually helped fight against the fascists from there, including famous Americans like the author Ernest Hemingway. And he's going to use his experience here to write uh, his famous novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls, uh, which is pretty 
be good and I recommend. Uh, other things that come out of the Spanish Civil War, including Pablo Picasso's famous painting, Guernica, uh, which describes the Nazi uh, and fascist bombing of the Spanish town of Guernica uh, from there. And again, this is a pretty uh, big painting if you're able to see this in uh, person. But again, uh, this is kind of showing the horrors of modern war here uh, in, in, the, in the eyes of one of the great 20th century artists, uh, again, captured from there. America at this time is clinging to isolationism. Um, isolationism is, is pretty similar to what it's science, to where you're trying, a country tries to isolate itself from the rest of the world and keep uh, uh, kind of its foreign relations presence uh, to a minimum. Why are they clinging to this? Well, it's belief in the United States that the USA only entered World War I. So that greedy uh, fat cat bankers and industrialists could get rich off of war profits. And so the United States it believes they need to stay out of war to keep them from doing that. And the Americans are really more determined than ever to avoid this war. The president of the United States at this point is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, and he has a, a, a foreign policy that kind of tries to slowly bring the United States out of this isolationist view. But again, there's a lot of Republicans in the Senate who, do, who don't like that. So in 1933, uh, he recognizes diplomatically the Soviet Union. In 1935, he gets Congress to pass the Neutrality Act, kind of uh, against his kind of world out view that outlawed arms sales or loans to nations at war or nations in a civil war, targeting again the lead up to the Spanish Civil War and then also uh, Italy and uh, Ethiopia. This is going to begin to break down uh, with Japan launching large-scale attacks on China in 1937, invading major cities and bombing Shanghai. And Roosevelt's able to find ways to send aid to China around the neutrality acts because Japan never really technically officially declares war. And so because of that, the Americans are able to send the famous Flying Tiger pilots and also arms and supplies. So the United States has American uh, pilots flying American planes, shooting American bullets at Japanese over the skies of China. Um, it already in 1937. So again, isolationism becomes really uh, uh, kind of a wishy-washy turn here as we move into the end of the 1930s. So this is Japan as it begins to go and expand, take over Korea in 1910 and 1931 through 33. It's taking over Manchukuo and then begins to take over other places before in 1937, which we'll circle back to, takes over the invasion of, of China there. Uh, the the the, the the invasion of Shanghai uh, is pretty uh, uh, brutal. It's, it's pretty famous. If you've seen the movie uh, Empire of the Sun, uh, Christian Bale by Steven Spielberg, uh, it does a pretty good job of showing this invasion from there. And it's a pretty uh, famous picture uh, that comes out of that. And the Americans, who uh, kind of been friends with China for a long time, send the famous Flying Tigers uh, pilots to aid the Chinese army uh, in their fight against the Japanese. Uh, and they're pretty famous for their P-40 planes with the uh, dark uh, uh, those aren't on there. The circling back to Nazi Germany, um, Hitler wants to form a union with Austria. Remember that that was one of the major provisions of the Treaty of Versailles was that Austria would not be allowed to join with Germany, even though the majority of Austrians really, really want to. And uh, the Austrians uh, do this. And so uh, what happens is called the Anschluss on March 12th, 1938. Uh, the Germans uh, kind of unite with Austria, and uh, uh, the Austrians kind of just let the German army come on in and kind of say the doors open, come on uh, through. Uh, Hitler was prepared to invade uh, with the army if needed, um, and, and but he it doesn't really have to. Again, the uh, climax of uh, the Sound of Music takes place uh, kind of like uh, along the backdrop of, of this. If you've seen that movie. Um, but by 1937, Hitler and the army are pretty much all ready to go. Uh, they want to go start. They want to start fighting. They want to start expanding. The army and the military is kind of saying, let's kind of wait towards 1939 uh, at, at the earliest. But Hitler's already ready to go. Uh, we saw him with without the generals backing going to the Rhineland. Uh, if any of the Western powers would have stood up to Hitler then. Um, it definitely uh, would have ended poorly for the Germans. But here they finally are starting to flex their muscles, and they're, they're flexing in a way where they kind of know already what the outcome is going to be because uh, the Austrians, particularly with the Austrian Nazi Party, is already from there. So Hitler begins to have more covetous eyes. Right? After taking over Austria, he begins asking for the Sudetenland. 
Now, the Sudetenland is an area where 3 million ethnic Germans, so pretty much Germans who look like Germans, act like Germans, speak German, have German stuff, uh, live in a west border region of the newly, uh, after World War I, created state of Czechoslovakia. That's called the Sudetenland. So it's kind of this border area that's a little bit wishy-washy that has a lot of Germans uh, that were in Germany prior to World War I, but after the defeat, have been taken out of that. Hitler, again, going back to Nazi beliefs, wants more living space, more Lebensraum, and wants and says that Sudetenland should belong to Germany. He begins to say that the Czechs are abusing Germans. Little Czech uh, boys are picking on little Czech uh, Germans right, at, in the elementary school playgrounds. Uh, Germans are being denied uh, um, jobs because they're German. They're getting picked on the streets. They're being a, the, the Czechs are being abusive. And Hitler says, just give us this little, tiny little space from there. And he's prepared to see the, seize this land for them. So he readies the army and prepares to invade another country again from there. So again, circling back, this is the Anschluss. This is the border of Austria and Germany. You can see from the, the dual-headed eagle, uh, the symbol for Austria, the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Nazis kind of swoop right through in there. Uh, they're greeted uh, by a whole lot of saluting people who are kind of forced to be out there. But again, uh, the Austrians who are in a pretty not great state uh, as themselves are kind of saying, hey, this is, this is good for us. We'll be with our German-speaking counterparts. Uh, it'll uh, all end uh, up well for this. So Hitler wants this Sudetenland, again, after already six months prior, eating up all of Austria. The Western Europeans, particularly the British, are kind of scared and aren't happy about this. So on September 30th, 1938, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, flies into Munich, Germany, and meets with Hitler and Mussolini and um, with a lot of the other uppity ups of the Nazi high command in there. At the, what's going to be called the Munich Conference, Hitler uses every last bit of charm and persuasion and kind of, uh, of moderation that he has in him on Chamberlain and really wines and dines and, and makes his case for Chamberlain and, and kind of lies really straight to his face from there. And out of this conference comes what's called the Munich Agreement. The Munich Agreement says, in exchange for the Sudetenland, Hitler promises Chamberlain and, by extension, Western Europe, that his territorial ambitions are fulfilled, and that's all he wants. Again, this is the idea that he just wants this little bit, teeny thing more. You have Austria, and it's okay, and then just give us the Sudetenland. We just want this little bit more. It's just a little bit carved. This, this Czechoslovakia is not, or really hasn't existed for very long. Give us over to Germany, and then all my territorial ambitions will be fulfilled. This is what I, as you remember, I, from the names I listed off there, no people from the Czechoslovakian government are consulted about this. And so Chamberlain very happily signs this agreement uh, away. Uh, without consulting the Czechs, takes this land from them um, because in Chamberlain's mind, the only care that he has is that S Hitler stops his warmongering and his trying to put Germany on a, a war footing and kind of brings uh, more peace back to this. And so what this is called out of Munich is the policy of appeasement. This is kind of, this is where you give up on your principles to pacify an, an aggressor. Uh, We'll, we'll show you a video clip here. Uh, Chamberlain is going to fly back from this conference and land in London, and he's going to hold up this uh, paper, this agreement that says this is this represents peace in our time. This uh, this piece of paper that Hitler gave us is going to be a, a allow for us to avoid another world war, and the, he's gone from this. Uh, you can kind of think of this idea from the old uh, classic children's book if you give a mouse a cookie. Right? What happens if you give a mouse a cookie? He's going to ask for a glass of milk. And then if you give a glass of milk, it's going to lead to a whole bunch of stuff and then it's all it's going to end up poorly for you from there. And that's kind of what appeasement is. Again, you just keep giving in and in and in and in to pacify an aggressor. And um, I mean, this can work uh, in some circumstances, particularly on the world stage. You give somebody this non-essential thing, and then you stop a war. That that that'll go you know, fair. But this really is going to become kind of a, um, a, a a negative connotation from this. Particularly, uh, people are going to see this after World War II. See how people treated Hitler to this, and are going to see that appeasement's no good. We need toughness. We need to stand up to aggression and other stuff, and that's going to lead towards uh, other problems and stuff from there. 
Winston Churchill is one of the very few voices, particularly in Britain and in the Western world, criticizing this decision, but no one really listens to him. Uh, if you're a fan of Churchill, uh, and we don't have a whole lot of time to dive into it. He, Churchill's really kind of, this is what's referred to as his wilderness period. He switched up government parties. Uh, he's one of the few people demanding that uh, Britain hold on to India. Uh, he's come down uh, harshly on the abdication uh, issue uh, in the British government. And so people really don't care kind of what he's saying. Um, and, and so no one listens to him uh, at this point uh, to try to stop this. Britain does, though, kind of hear the Churchill voices in the back of the room and other people. And they do begin a crash rearming program as they kind of see Hitler and other people um, in Europe ramping up their uh, armed forces. The British begin to do that as well as they kind of can see uh, this. So this is the Munich Conference again, September of 1938. There's Chamberlain, uh, and he's going and he's meeting with Adolf Hitler. Uh, there's Mussolini, there's Hermann Goering, and there's other big uppity ups in, in there. And again, Hitler's going to use every last bit of his charm on Chamberlain uh, to be able to say that if he just gives him this tiny little slip more of territory, right, that's going to be it. And so Chamberlain is going to fly back to uh, London with this, and let's hear what he has to say. First, I want to say that the settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem, which has now been achieved, is, in my view, only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. So, uh, we saw the clip, clip there, and so this is what, uh, Germany begins to do, and I know it's German, so I'll learn some German there for you. So this is Germany prior uh, to uh, this. In March of 1938, it's going to go down here into Austria, and it's going to go and take over it with the Anschluss. And then this little territory, this little slip of Czechoslovakia is what Hitler calls the Sudetenland. And this is what's given to the Germans uh, prior to this. As you begin to see, though, what is the shape that begins to develop here uh, from this, and I go and ask you, well, what do you think is going to happen? Can you predict where Hitler is going to go and ask for next? We've given him the cookie of Austria. We've given him the glass of milk of the Sudetenland. Where is he going to go to next? And again, uh, Czechoslovakia should be, but you'd be screaming into your uh, computers right now. So uh, again, uh, they move into uh, pretty quickly following uh, the Munich Agreement into there. And again, he's met by a lot of cheering crowds of a, a pretty famous picture. Uh, a lot of people aren't happy uh, that their uh, new land that they were promised after World War I is kind of from there. Uh, as we move into 1939 on March 15th, Germany just invades the rest of Czechoslovakia. Uh, they said he was done with the uh, Sudetenland, but obviously that's not the case. And what do the Western powers do? Nothing. There's no response from anyone uh, to say, hey, stop, do that. The Soviet Union uh, says that it's going to just remain neutral in any other upcoming things. And as we begin to move out of the spring of 1939, Hitler again starts the same old song and dance routine of now, hey, Germans in Poland are being abused, just like the poor Germans in Austria and the poor Germans in the state land and the poor Germans in Czechoslovakia. Now the Germans in Poland are being abused from there, and you can kind of see where he's going to be leading into them. Now, Hitler, uh, being a little bit uh, uh, of a historian himself and, and aware of what's happened in, in prior uh, German uh, conflicts, is that he wants to avoid having to fight on two fronts in any future war. He is ma his main goal is to uh, attack and get rid of the Soviet Union, but he realizes that in the short term he has to work with the Soviet Union so that he can get the Western European nations off his back before he can turn his full uh, military attention towards them. So in the early parts of 1939, uh, he begins to negotiate with the Soviet Union, uh, and those negotiations bear out in August 23rd of 1939, where the Nazis and the Soviet Union signed the Non-Aggression Pact where Germany and Russia commit to never, ever, 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 ever attack each other 
are, are from there. And this is the part of the pack that's released uh, from there. Right? The second part is kept secret that only the Germans and the uh, Soviets know is that Germany tells the Soviet Union, yeah, we're going to invade Poland. Uh, and the Soviet Union, kind of uh, on edge about this, says, well, what are we going to get out of this? And this becomes kind of a dual-edged invasion of Poland, where Germany will invade Poland from the west, the Soviet Union will invade Poland from the east, the Germans and the Soviets know exactly where they're going to go and stop, and Poland is divided up amongst themselves uh, for there. And so that begins out of this, and this is called the molotov uh, Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, as well as the non-aggression pact, uh, as, again, the uh, different people from there, and you can see Smiley Stalin uh, from this. So basically what this pact is saying is that the Nazis are going to invade uh, into Poland, right, and the Soviets are going to invade into other countries uh, from there, and they're vowing that they're drawing a pretty strict line of where they're going to stop and, and where they're going to go from there. So on September 1st, 1939, Germany goes and invades Poland. Uh, early in the wee wee hours of September 1st, uh, SS troops snuck over the border. Uh, they killed some Poles who were in the wrong place in the wrong time, changed their clothes into German-looking clothes, and then began to take a whole bunch of pictures, uh, and, and then be sent that to the uh, media stations in Nazi Germany, who then began to drum up the alarm of protesting, hey, look, Poles are killing Germans, and so now we have to go and protect the Germans in Poland, and so that's the pretext for the invasion. The invasion of Poland uh, begins uh, and marks a new type of warfare that the Germans have been developing from the 1930s called Blitzkrieg. And this means lightning war uh, in, in German. And this is the new German military strategy that they've worked out uh, with kind of taking advantage of in, uh, better communications and, and more use. What Blitzkrieg does is make use of new tanks, trucks, and powerful aircraft in order to be able to take an enemy by surprise. One of the major fundamental tenets of Blitzkrieg is that you don't attack a enemy at their strong points. You try to attack at their weak points and sweep behind the front lines to run amok with your quick moving tanks and, and aircraft and other stuff. So again, if you're think of this like a, a river and a stream, what happens when a river and a stream runs to a rock? It doesn't just hit that rock and keep going and going and going. It just flows around from side to side. And then you go and you cut that rock off from behind or, or from there. And that's the basic general idea of what the, the Germans are doing uh, pretty effectively. Uh, this is really the first time anybody's ever seen this and the increased mechanization and uh, um, German units really catch the Poland's Poles by surprise, again, particularly because they're being attacked on the other side simultaneously by the Russians. Uh, the Germans are given 24 hours to stop, and then when that deadline comes and goes on September 3rd, 1939, Britain and France both declare war on Germany over their invasion of Poland. Uh, Poland itself is going to cease to exist within one month of fighting. Uh, the Germans are pretty much going to destroy every Polish aircraft on the ground before they have a chance to get it up, up there. Uh, and that pretty much gives the Germans uh, air superiority for the entire uh, month-long campaign. Uh, and again, we want to keep reminding you that the Poles put up pretty uh, dogged resistance, uh, which uh, is, uh, is is pretty outstanding is considering that, again, they're being invaded from both sides. This, the Poles are really un, unprepared for the mechanized assault by the Germans from the west and a simultaneous invasion from the east by the Russians, which really causes all sorts of problems. Uh, and so you, uh, a, a bit of a video clip here that just kind of uh, briefly kind of shows you uh, some of the numbers and more importantly, the mechanization of what the Germans are doing here with Blitzkrieg. The Pole begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. Poland's 34 million inhabitants, crushed, scattered, and enslaved. Tens of thousands of square miles of territory shrink before the movement of lightning-armored columns. Poland and the world learn the meaning of a grim new word, Blitzkrieg. Here is shown the initiation of that phase of modern warfare. These pictures of the preparation for attack and later the actual combat were all made by German frontline cameramen. Therefore, they stress Nazi superiority. Success is unimpeded as Hitler's divisions move against outnumbered Polish defenders. Later, on other world battlefronts, the Allies are to destroy the myth of the invincibility of the Nazi armies. But this is Hitler at the peak of his armed might, and the record of a nation overrun in just days is of military as well as historical importance. So, uh, the, again, the, the big difference with uh, the idea here is you don't want to 
to uh, have a war devolve into the trench warfare of World War I. And so Blitzkrieg emphasizes speed and quickness and uh, of in mechanization to be able to have increased uh, uh, working with uh, artillery and infantry and tanks and airplane all working kind of as, as one movement as you can have uh, planes uh, strafing from the sky and dropping uh, uh, somewhat precision dive bombs on uh, attacking Polish forces and be able to communicate all this together kind of in real time. And that, that's what the Nazis were able to do. And that's what gives them their ability to move quickly through uh, Poland uh, within the month and allow for Hitler to review his troops uh, successfully at the end of the uh, campaign from there. Uh, the Poles themselves are going to be rounded up. Uh, that's not going to end well for any of the, the Polish soldiers from there. And a lot of them are, are brutally murdered in a series of massacres by both the Soviets and the Nazis. In some places just being lined up and shot uh, in the streets themselves uh, in, there in uh, Poland. So after Poland falls, uh, Hitler is going to take his, it's going to take time for Germany to reorganize to fight in the West. Again, it can't keep fighting eastward because they have the non-aggression pact with the Soviets there. And so this lull in the fighting is the Germans kind of turn the war machine around and begin to move it across Poland that they just take and through Germany to face towards the West is referred to as the phony war. Because, again, the war is technically doing but there's not a lot of people doing stuff and again britain france are trying to rebuild their forces from there it's during this time that stalin begins the annexation of the baltic states of latvia east estonia and lithuania uh there's no response at all from the west uh towards the s actions in late 1939 the soviet union attacks finland and uh the Finns put up a pretty dogged resistance uh, the soviets really don't do a very good job uh, of doing anything towards like it's going to take soviet might and manpower to finally defeat them in, in, in a winter war from there the phony war is going to end uh come to an abrupt end in april of 1940 where hitler conducts surprise attacks on denmark and norway uh, he, he needs these to be able to use as bases to launch attacks on great britain and then in may of 1940 he's going to launch attacks on the netherlands belgium luxembourg are also going to be overrun by the german armies but that um We'll leave that for another day. So we'll just finish here uh, with the Nazis, uh, again, enjoying the spoils of their successes taking over Poland and beginning to turn their eyes on Western Europe uh, to be able to go and take over stuff.